Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, first session of the day, uh, despite a boff which we already had at 8 a.m. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of the GRASGIS community. This is a joint talk with Veronika Andreo, uh, Václav Petras and Anna Petrasova. She, they are also here. Um, of course, some more people are here being author of some parts of what I will present shortly. Ah, interestingly, the mouse doesn't do anything. Yeah. Ah, this magic. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So, just a few words about myself. Um, I'm Markus Neteler. I'm involved in the GRASS project since 1997, being a user even longer, but uh, anyway. So, I'm from Germany. I'm now, after 15 years of Italy, located in Bonn for a while. Uh, and I'm running the, with my other com uh, colleagues the company Mundialis. We're doing a lot of open source stuff. Well, and I'm also, I was also involved in the uh, founding of OSGEO. So, I want, what I, do I want to present here? Uh, for those not being familiar with GRASGIS, this naturally exists, even if the software is there for a long time. I have one slide concerning that. Uh, and especially, I want to showcase what has happened in the last 12 months. So, this is the state of software talk style and I will present um, the new things with special focus on code quality and automated releases, some community um, contributions and more. So I know some people here in the room, we talked about it yesterday, uh, do not know GRASGIS yet. So we have one slide. GRASGIS is a system which basically does all kinds of uh, geospatial analysis. Uh, with raster data, vector, time series support, and so on. There's a graphical user interface. You can do image processing, uh, powerful spatial modeling, like watershed modeling, uh, landscape analysis, structure analysis, and so on. Originally, it's a project coming from the US Army. It was started in 1982 with the development with the first uh, release in 1984. Now, you must remember that in 1984, there was no uh, int ubiquitous internet available to everybody, but it was tedious and you have to, had to send around magnetic tapes in order to distribute the software. So GRASS itself is a founding member of uh, OSGEO and we now have accumulated like eight, uh, 39 years of development. You can ideally follow this on Twitter, they are also on other social media channels, but I guess the Twitter one is the most active. Okay, um, how does it look like nowadays? These are some screenshots here. Uh, what we say, GRASS is a very uh, mature system. So with uh, decades of development, you can imagine that also special cases have been considered, like in watershed ma uh, modeling under extreme conditions, where numerical stability is an issue. Uh, this has been, I would say, solved here. We have lots of um, let's say, parts in the software like vector network analysis, hydrological tools, quite a bunch for uh, watershed modeling, stream modeling, and so on. We have lots of image processing tools, uh, object-based uh, things. The full time series support, which is not only limited to raster data, but also offers vector-based time series support and more. Well, and uh, you see here briefly some functionality. So the roadmap, what has happened in the last 12 months, we still feed occasionally the GRASS 7. Uh, GRASS 7.8 is the latest stable here, um, but it is phasing out. We have been publishing GRASS 8.0. This was the big announcement some time ago. And um, now we are with GRASS 8.2. And again, there are uh, lots of new features, which I will present shortly. Um, semantic versioning, so what does these uh, versions mean? We now adopt a more strict system and we will abandon what we have done in the past, I don't remember how many years, uh, that we have even and odd numbers which uh, indicate development version and uh, stable version. We just go on with the numbers now to make it easier. 
Um, so, the first number says, uh, the major number, it, the eight in this case, is uh, features and uh, new stuff is coming and it may even break things towards, say, grass seven. Yeah? But from time to time you have to do that and uh, innovation has to be incorporated and so on. The second one are minor versions which bring new features but don't break anything and the micro stuff is usually bug fixes or minor uh, changes. Okay, but you are here to know what is new. So what has been nicely done and we had a workshop the other day on this um, Grass GIS and Jupyter Notebooks. This is work of uh, of uh, Google Summer of Code, so we are enrolling mostly every year in the Google Summer of Code uh, activities. We have one too many uh, projects running then in parallel and here a lot has been incorporated in one of these activities. The author is sitting, main author is sitting over there, Caitlin. <laughs> um, she has been implementing uh, a way to interact through Jupyter Notebook with Grass. And as you can see, you can uh, display vector data, you can analyze raster data, it's quite convenient. If you're not familiar with Jupyter at all, you can see here your code, um, you write your code in a web browser and then you send it to the grass uh, behind. It can be a local installation, it can also be remote, uh, depends uh, on what you do. So one more, uh, what we like with Jupyter Notebook, it's ideal for teaching, it's also ideal for prototyping, so if you want to invent a new method uh, to address your problems you have, then you can nicely program, it's not too complicated, you can combine uh, text, so documentation and code, and then execute it line by line, go back, edit, and so forth, and eventually write it out as a Python script, that's super convenient. Here's an example. Uh, with an interactive map. On the left side, hand side, you see here uh, the background map is OpenStreetMap and it just drops the, the raster data or vector data from grass directly onto this view. Uh, there's, also oh, sorry. there's also time series support. Uh, so you have a time slider here, you can see it is moving. This is some visual analysis for, uh, from pedestrian point of view and you can animate stuff there. Uh, by the way, this um, presentation, this, the link will follow at the very end again, is uh, online, so you can try this link and launch uh, exactly this computation in a cloud instance. Okay, what else is new? Semantic labels, what does that mean? Uh, uh, imagine you have multi-spectral data with uh, blue, green, red channel, infrared, and so on. Then you have to remember in the blue channel in, with Sentinel is two and with Landsat it's maybe also two, maybe not, and a different system it would be channel one. It's a bit annoying. So what we, uh, you do not want to remember it every time, but you want to just say, okay, I want the blue channel of Landsat. And with the semantic label, labels, it is mapped automatically to whatever it is. And you can even register your own. So if you compute NDVI, for example, uh, then you can also label this thing as NDVI and later uh, use it as whatever map name uh, .ndvi. And this quite simplifies things. You can basically write what you want. Um, so labeling of raster data is uh, a convenient thing here and we are now uh, working on integration of making use of it in the commands so that way you can just say do the image classification with this, this and this band and you don't have to indicate the band numbers but you can use then the band labels. We have uh, new support for PDAL. There was PDAL support for a long time, but it was kind of trick using also PDAL tools. This is now a new approach written in, I think, C++, if I'm not wrong. Um, well, and uh, the idea is that you can import uh, laser scan point clouds into grass, and if you want to rasterize them, uh, uh, during import, that means you allocate a number of points falling into one raster cell. You can then count the number. You can say, okay, generate a map with only the maximum value which falls into this particular cell, minimum and another, uh, how many, seven, 16 uh, binning methods. So there are 19 altogether. 
in order to produce your data. So you have to the left your point cloud and to the right what comes out if you look at it in 3D view. And like this, it is pretty easy to deal with uh, huge point clouds. Pidal is very, or Poodle, uh, pronounced in US as far as I know. Um, it is then pretty easy to turn this into raster data to then further work on that. A lot of work has been done on parallelization. Um, we have OpenMP parallelization now in some modules. You can see here the commands, so that is raster time series, univariate statistic, uh, neighborhood filters, patching, resampling, and slope aspect. And additionally, there's a benchmarking library if you want to do your own and want to figure out, for example, is it better to have many CPUs or maybe you are then saturating uh, the I.O. of the system, let's say the writing and reading of data, um, so you can do some tests and you can generate plots and this is rather straightforward if you want to go into the depth of things. But as a user, you can just say, okay, please use multiple cores and then uh, those commands will be parallelized. Uh, OpenMP is, uh, let's say, a pretty straightforward way of parallelization. You can imagine it's just a simple, oversimplified example. If you loop over pixels because you have to compute something, you could possibly take one row, uh, send it to one CPU, take the next row at the same time, send to the next, and then blockwise uh, compute things in parallel. So something like this. We have more parallel tools. Some of them are also add-ons. So we have like, I don't know, almost 20 different tools which have been parallelized also on, in the Python world. So Grass consists of C, C++, and Python. Um, depends, uh, you can write your, uh, your modules as you prefer. And for Python um, programmers, oh, we have the possibility to, uh, to use either multiprocessing or parallel module queue by task. I don't want to go into details here but there are different approaches and at some point there will also be a scientific paper um, explaining things, but of course stuff is also documented. What else? Uh, the graphical user interface, those who have been using GRASS in the past, they possibly well remember that there's this uh, welcome screen, you have to select stuff and many people just struggle from the very beginning. This thing is gone. So in GRASS 8, it is no longer there, and as in so many other GIS systems, um, the main author is sitting there, by the way, Linda, um, you have the uh, first time user experience as in other systems. You just get presented with the entire menu system. Uh, you are welcomed here with some welcome text to show you around, and um, then you can start right away. So this is a it was quite a uh, tough job to change things, uh, but uh, it has happened, and now GRASS is starting like that. For those who want to experiment, starting with GRASS A2, you can go to the settings um, and then say, I want a single window. So this is all in one window now. You have here the text again. Here are the, uh, the, is the legend of maps. Here the map itself, and here is the choice of uh, functionality you can use. There are also the tabs here for console and also for Python. If you want to hack in uh, with Python right away, you can do that from the graphical user interface. So you have the option of single user interface now. What else? We have been working on code quality and it's always a good idea to test code from the very beginning. For example, someone is submitting a change or a new functionality. We want to automatically check if this fulfills uh, some rules and uh, for example for Python, uh, in case of Python it is important which, um, yeah, which indentation is used and so on. Python is quite picky about that and why not check it right away. So someone submits a change. If it is in Python then it will undergo some tests and it will complain in case you have some indentation wrong or whatever. It will precisely tell you, look, this line looks ugly because of this and that reason, please fix it. And it cannot be merged into the core system nor into the add-ons before this has been fixed. Similar stuff has been done with C. And uh, since we have this in place now, we also had to fix the entire code base. And you can imagine that this is quite an effort. But this has happened. 
Um, also new, uh, being the release manager for too many years, uh, it was always a, really a quite time-consuming job to write the release notes. And um, Vlasek, he was uh, spending quite a deal of time to automate this. We now get these release, release notes entirely automatically, even with all these uh, sections. So like what has happened in the graphical user interface, was what was in raster, vector, image processing, whatsoever, libraries, documentation, and so on. Um, we use the git log uh, for that. So if you commit a change into the repository, then you are kindly uh, invited to write a meaningful line. What are you submitting there? And from this, we generate this uh, stuff here. And also, the software itself is then packaged and put there. OK, not much time left. I will quickly show a few user contributions. Um, we have a projection picker. This also exists in other GIS software. It's also here, so you know where you are and you want to know which are eligible official projections. Uh, you can take a look there. Uh, we have new lens slide uh, detection software called our survey. There's also a scientific publication. Uh, by the way, if you go to the presentation, this is a link and it always brings you to the manual page of this add-on. Uh, FAIR data we have been discussing in the birth of Feather an hour ago. Uh, Grass can also import this with this add-on and read from different data warehouses using threads or NetCDF, also space-time cubes and so on. Um, you can take a look if it interests you. Another one is visual exposure. So these are just random examples, just to show you how many different options are there. Visual exposure uh, computed here um, with cumulative view sheds, also an interesting topic if you have to deal with visibility, for example, for wind power, windmills, and whatever you can imagine. OK, we want to get you involved, code contributions. Um, we have been moving a while ago to GitHub. This was a very good idea. I mean, to move to Git was especially a good idea. GitHub is just where it sits. But it, uh, we picked a lot of new contributors because things are much more easy nowadays. And um, that was a good idea. We have, of course, a discussion forum, mailing list, and so on. And we have instructions if you want to start and have no clue how to do it, you can go there. Other contributions, if you do not want to program, you are also welcome to translate, for example, or to uh, suggest uh, improvements to the documentation or document uh, or write documentation for something which is rather undocumented. We have a wiki, wiki, we have social channels and so on. Please talk to us if you have anything. So the last point is sponsorship. Uh, as any uh, open source project, we also occasionally need some money, for example, to organize code sprints and so on. We have been moving to Open Collective. Uh, this is under the hood of uh, OSGO there. So we are receiving donations um, and try to use them in a meaningful way. Um, one important part is here a student grants program we have set up recently. And here uh, we also already got some nice results, so you can apply for that. The next round will be soonish, I believe. We are setting up a new round of student grants. As a student, you can then apply and uh, ideally develop something new. In the wiki, we have the details. Well, and that's basically it. Just to uh, tell you, there's some bonus material behind. I will not go through as there's no time, but you can uh, if you like, please check, here is the link, please check uh, the presentation yourself and I've put some more user contributions into the bonus section and thank you for your attention. <laughs>